This is the news from the ABC, read by Michael Charlton. Here are the headlines. A special session of the United Nations organization is to be held next week. A tornado has destroyed two towns in the west of the United States, and Australia will be sending more goods to Britain as a result of a recent agreement. News sessions are a feature of Australian broadcasting. Probably more people listen to the news than to any other single program on the air. But not so many people know that before the announcer's familiar voice can be heard, the Postmaster General's department must do its part. Here at the post office, skilled technicians set up the program channels on special switchboards for the relaying of broadcasts from one state to another. Broadcasts for Commonwealth-wide networks, including national stations, pass through this central switching panel from the studio to the transmitting stations. National broadcasting stations are built and, as far as technical operations are concerned, are staffed and maintained by post office personnel. Balanced on this tiny insulator is a down thrust weight varying up to 135 tons. 730 feet high, this broadcast mast was constructed under the direction of post office engineers. Not only does the post office provide technical staff for national stations, and Department of Information shortwave transmitters. It also provides essential assistance to commercial stations, although these companies employ their own technical staff. Many programs originate outside broadcasting studios. For these, as well as studio programs, the post office provides landlines to enable them to be broadcast simultaneously from a number of stations. Monrack seems to have been giving a little trouble. Now here's a chance. They're racing. Landlines between states and between different cities and towns are also provided by the post office. This work involves a host of skilled men and women in all sorts of jobs. The linemen, for instance, building and maintaining landlines. The technician, controlling radio hookups. But technical control of broadcasting is only one example of the wide variety of post office activities. Many of its services are a common part of our daily lives. Can we imagine life without the postman? Or the country mailman, on time in all kinds of weather? The junior postal officer, delivering telegrams? Telephonist ready to establish voice contact between cities, distant towns, or even other countries. Phonogram operators receiving telegrams from subscribers. Draftsmen, busy designing new installations. Engineers and technicians, all these and many more. We post a letter in a pillar box and it is delivered in Redfern, Paris, or Alaska. We can speak to telephone subscribers in almost any part of the world. These are services which affect each of us intimately, whether in business or in our domestic life. The post office even goes to sea. Special cable ships lay new submarine cables and maintain old ones. Communications girdle the earth by sea, by land and by air. To provide fully trained officers, the post office operates a vast training scheme. Training goes on all the time, all over the continent. Every modern method of teaching is used. In model post offices, in each capital city, thorough practical training in post office work is given in modern classrooms to specially selected students. There are classes too for the telegraphist and postal clerk of tomorrow. Here they learn Morse telegraphy and the operation of modern high-speed machine telegraph systems. All students are thoroughly trained for positions of their own choosing, their life job. In well-equipped workshops, the boys put into practice the things they have learned. They are encouraged to discuss their problems with their instructors friendly, helpful technicians who have themselves been through similar courses. Every lad is assured of individual, kindly tuition.
Training in these schools covers a wide range of interesting technical subjects under practical conditions. Bench and field work is undertaken, and training is given in telephone, telegraph, and radio engineering practices and research. A typical training course is that provided for technicians. Boys can commence between the ages of 15 and 18 years. Training goes on in departmental schools, in technical colleges, and for higher professional positions at universities. Tuition course may last up to five years. Great care is taken to intersperse theory with practical work, and throughout the whole course, emphasis is always on individual tuition. These girls, students today, are tomorrow's telephonists, keeping open the channels of worldwide communication. They receive full pay while training. Soon, they will occupy positions offering every possible opportunity for promotion, generous employment conditions, and a lifetime of public service. When classes are over, students can get attractive meals in pleasant surroundings. Most schools have their own cafeteria, where appetizing meals are provided at reasonable prices. Morning and afternoon tea is also available. Amenities, such as lending libraries, are not forgotten, and study is confined to normal working hours. Home study is kept at a minimum, and rest periods are generous. Ample facilities are provided for recreation. Table tennis is just one of these. Every kind of sport is encouraged. One school even has an actual broadcasting station where the boys make up and transmit their own programs. These boys are the communications engineers of tomorrow. Today, they are learning their job so that they may take their place in one of the most interesting and highly skilled of present day occupations. Like all boys who are taking training courses in the post office, they know that when they complete their training, they are assured of well-paid, secure positions for life. And that's the end of this news broadcast which came to you from the ABC. The next news will be heard on the Interstate Network at 9 o'clock Eastern Time.